Okay, kiddos, uh, we keep going. Now we're going to go to the ear. Now remember to uh, check my playlist for how we actually hear. Uh, those are some great YouTube videos that you can watch. Um, so let's take a look at the actual ear here. So here's the anatomy of the ear, the outer ear, which is the oracle, also the pina. So the reason that it's shaped like this so that it can collect the sound waves uh, right in here and we have to take those sound waves and we have to convert them to a signal that the brain can process so in doing that as the sound waves come in they go through the auditory canal the external auditory canal it hits the tympanic membrane or the eardrum and it vibrates then it goes into the three smallest bones in the body which would be the malleus incus and the stapes then it will th go through the oval window and then it will go through the cochlea and as these vibrations go through the cochlea they go through this fluid called uh, endolymph and that lymph will help kind of process that uh, those sound waves and then it will go into the cochlear nerve okay again the video is very detailed and i'll show you exactly how we go from what I'm saying right now through here, through the cochlea, vestibular cochlea, and then to your brain says, okay, Patel's saying this. This is important. Please study this for the quiz. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, these guys are uh, really unique in the set. Remember that the inner ear also does your balance. So these semicircular ducts, this is the lateral, this is the posterior, and this is the superior or anterior. Now the lateral one will do more no, so when you do no, it goes back and forth. The superior one will go back and forth when you do um, yes and no. And then the posterior will carry these crystals back and forth when you go side to side. And these little crystals, they also have a fluid in here and they have little hairs that kind of detect where your head is in space. Now as we get older, unfortunately these hairs and the little crystals start to calcify so we have to go a lot slower. Otherwise if we move too fast we'll be in a constant uh, state of dizziness and that's not good. Now if you're young and you have dizziness you may have a condition called BPPV uh, and I'll show that uh, little video in uh, class so that you can see that. Okay. So again, uh, um, here's the auditory tube, or called the eustachian tube. Okay, so, and this one is a lot smaller in kids, and that's why it's very, and goes straight to the, near the oral cavity, and that's why they're more prone to ear infections, because their mouth is uh, full of bacteria and viruses, and it can go right into this area. So if you were a child and you had frequent ear infections, then you can say, okay, it makes sense. But as you get older, this canal gets larger and the angle increases, so you're less likely to get uh, ear infections as an adult. Again, here's uh, pretty much the same thing, just a different view. The oracle of the ear canal, which is the external, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Uh, the middle ear, again, is the tympanic membrane, uh, tympanic cavity of the temporal bone, auditory or eustachian tube where you get ear infections. The ossicles are the malleus, incus, and stapes, and the oval window, and the muscles, the smallest muscles, are the stapedius and tensor tympani, which are the smallest muscles in the body. Now the inner ear is a bony labyrinth, uh, it's a maze in the temporal bone, it's a membranous labyrinth, has a tube within a maze, and the fluid is called endolymph uh, in the membranous labyrinth, and there's also perilymph, which is fluid between the membranous labyrinths and bones. Remember, when you talk, you have these vibrations, and the vibrations will be carried in this fluid and then sent to the cochlear nerve and to the brain for interpretation. You also have the vestibule, which is the utricle and the saccule, and those will help uh, uh, kind of gauge where you are as far as proprioception and where your head is in space. Uh, also you have the three semicircular canals and the cochlea. It's kind of a snail shaped. Uh, if you like escargot then you'll know what that means. Uh, escargot is snails. Yummy. All right so again uh, you have some kind of uh, uh, vibration. So let's say it's me talking. The sound wave represents alternating areas of high and low pressure. Okay. The tympanic memory vibrates in response to the sound wave. Vibrations are amplified across the ossicle, so it just makes it louder, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Then the vibrations against the oval window set up 
standing wave in fluid, so it's like a wave in the vestibuli. Okay. And the pressure uh, um, bends the membrane of the cochlear duct at a point of maximum vibration for a given frequency, causing hair cells in the basal membrane to vibrate. So again, we're taking what I'm saying, it's vibrating against the eardrum, vibrating against the, the ossicles, and then going into this little maze area where we're going to interpret that. So sound wave causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. This vibration is amplified as it moves across the milius, incus, and stapes. The amplified vibration is picked up by the oval window causing pressure waves in the fluid of the scala vestibula and scala tympani. The complexity of the pressure waves is determined by the changes in amplitude and frequency of the sound waves entering the ear. <laughs> so it continues to go on and the frequency coding in the cochlea, which is the snail, the standing sound wave generated in the cochlea by the movement of the oval window deflects the basal membrane on the basis of the frequency of the sound. Therefore, hail cells at the base of the cochlea are activated only by high frequencies, whereas those at the apex of the cochlea are activated by low frequency. So this interpretation of high and low frequencies and I think we uh, during class we did the hearing test say how old are your ears again uh, so it's a, f a matter of high frequency as you age the ability to hear a certain amount of high frequency obviously deteriorates so here's the anatomy of the membranous labyrinth uh, again remember from the bones here's the uh, petrous portion of the temporal bone right here and then you have the vestibular saculae and the utricles and the ampullae, which measure acceleration, linear acceleration. Okay, so all these are meant to see where you are in space and where your head is, and this will help with balance and equilibrium. Okay, so here's a microscopic uh, histology slide of the scala vestibula, scala tympani, and the scala media, and the basilar membrane. The auditory brain stem uh, mechanisms. Uh, so here's the sound source. If it's uh, right in the middle, then you get it equally on both ears. But if it's slightly towards the left side, you're going to hear it slightly sooner on your left than your right. And then that's how the brain interprets that, hey, there's something on the left side. Again, watching that YouTube video of how we hear will help uh, uh, with animations uh, see this. It's very interesting. Uh, so the inner ear uh, is the cochlear duct is the organ of hearing. Uh, the spirals around the modulus and axis of spongy bone and they contain a spiral organ with four rows of hair cells, one row of inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells. The stereocilia of hair cells project into the tectorial membrane. The hair cell synapse with sensory neurons that form the spiral ganglia, cranial nerve 8, and they contain endolymph. Okay. The cochlear duct is also known as sometimes the scala media, so you can use either or, the scala media or the cochlear duct. Now the scala vestibuli is the chamber above the vestibular membrane, begins near the oval window and that contains perilymph. And the scala tympani is a chamber below the basilar membrane, ends at the round window that's covered by secondary, contains perilymph. Now again, uh, knowing why we have that it just helps uh, the vibrations in the, in the ear be conducted a little bit faster and then it's sent to the brain for interpretation. Even small moise, noises cause pupils of the eyes to dilate. So it's believed that is why surgeons, watchmakers, and others who perform very delicate manual operations are so bothered by uninvited noise. The sound causes their pupils to change focus and blur their vision, making it harder to do their job. So here's the cochlea. So here's that uh, perilymph, and then here's the endolymph. Remember, the endolymph is found in the scala media or cochlear duct, and the perilymph is found in the scala vestibuli, and vibrations are going through this fluid, and then they eventually end up in the cochlear nerve. Air vibrates the tympanic membrane. Okay, The tympanic membrane will vibrate the ossicles. The ossicles push against the round window, vibrating fluid in the inner ear. That's your perilymph and endolymph. The bending of the stereocilia opens ion channels and starts the electrical signal. The hair cells near base of the cochlea respond to the high pitches. The hair cells near the tip of the cochlea respond to low pitches. And here's a mechanical model of the auditory function. Vibrations in the outer ear, vibrations intensify in the middle ear, and then they get interpreted in the fluid in the inner ear, and then they're sent to the brain. 
So hair cells excite cochlear nerve fibers, then the cochlear nerve projects to the cochlear nucleus, the cochlear nucleus projects to the superior olivary nucleus, the superior olivary nucleus projects to the inferior colliculus, inferior colliculus projects to the thalamus, and the thalamus projects to the primary auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. So you see how it goes by, right? And then basically it's the temporal lobe that will interpret your hearing and then say, okay, that's what you're saying. You're like, Patel, you've been talking for 10 minutes straight. Don't you ever be quiet? That's your brain saying, no, Patel must talk. <laughs> oh boy. Again, the vestibular apparatus, which is uh, the semicircular canals, they t detect equilibrium, coordination, balance, orientation. Uh, as we get older, these uh, get a little bit calcified. They turn and uh, our response is less. The three semicircular canals detect angular acceleration. And the utricle and the secula each have a macula to detect static equilibrium and linear acceleration. So here it is. So again, these are these little crystals, these autoliths that we talk about. And then here's the hair cells. So as these autoliths move, you see how the hair cells say, okay, well, it looks like he's, his head is pointing down now. So the saccule is for vertical. The utricle is for horizontal detection. And then each hair cell of the macula has a kinocilium embedded in the autolytic membrane. Okay, so the semicircular canals uh, anterior, posterior, and lateral. Uh, the anterior is also sometimes known as superior. So, all right. Hair cells project into the gelatinous scapula. So here's the crista ampullaris, and then so then you move forward, direction of rotation, head rotation, and this goes uh, the other way. And your brain says, "Oh, looks like we're spinning." Yikes. And then, as you know, you've been on a roller coaster or a merry-go-round. This uh, it takes a while for this lymph to settle down and say, whoa, what's going on here? And then eventually it settles down. So then that's how motion sickness uh, medications work. Basically, they uh, slow down this conduction and basically you're, you're, you're bringing you down a notch, just like a glass of wine. Okay. Linear acceleration, uh, coding by the maculae. Uh, the maculae are specialized for sensing linear acceleration, such as when gravity acts on tilting the head, or if the head starts moving in a straight line. The difference in inertia between the hair cells, stereocilia, and the autolith in which they are embedded leads to a shearing force that causes the stereocilia to bend in the direction of the linear. So the bending of these senses, like the autolith and the hair cells, says, okay, looks like he's tilting his head forward. And again, as we get older, these start to calcify and the reaction time is a lot slower. And here's the semicircular canals working the same way. Um, all right, let's go to the eye now. Now the eye, <coughs> accessory structures of the orbit. So here's the pupil, here's the iris, here's the eyelashes. Again, the eyebrow is there to keep sweat out of your eye. Here's the sclera, which is the white part, the cornea, where you put your contacts, the iris, which is the colored part. Okay, so blue, uh, green, uh, brown, hazel. Okay, here's the lacrimal carnical, palpebral fissure, the superior palpebral sulcus, inferior palpebral uh, sulcus. Okay. Conjunctiva, you've heard of conjunctivitis, which is pink eye. Okay. That means wash your hands. Don't put poop in your eye and you won't get pink eye. All right, here's the lacrimal apparatus, which is where we cry from. So remember, you cry from the outside in, and tears are meant to cleanse the ear. It has antibiotic properties, okay? So you cry, and then it runs down the lacrimal sac, the inferior meatus, and then basically that's why you get a little runny nose when you cry, because the fluid goes down into the inferior meatus of the nasal and it drips down here. So that's the lacrimal gland. Tears travel across the conjunctiva and cornea. The lacrimal punctum is a small pore in the eyelid, right in here. A lacrimal uh, canal, it's right here, okay. And the nasal lacrimal duct, right in here, drains to the nasal cavity. Uh, the extrinsic eye muscles, you've got the superior rectus that moves uh, up, inferior rectus that goes down, medial rectus that goes medially, lateral rectus 
that does laterally, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. So the motions for the superior oblique will be more uh, down and in, and then for the inferior oblique will be up and in. So here are the eyes, uh, here's the optic nerve, lateral rectus, so that means this is a right eye. Okay. So you, here's your superior oblique, superior rectus, inferior rectus. Uh, here's the lateral rectus, that's innervated by abducens, cranial nerve 6. Here's a superior oblique muscle that's innervated by trochlear nerve, number 4. And then all the rest are innervated by oculomotor nerve 3. Okay, so superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. About one third of the human race, 33%, has 20 20 vision. So glasses and contact wearers are hardly alone in the world where two thirds of the population have less than perfect vision. The amount of people with perfect vision decreases further, of course, as we age. And the anatomy of the eyeball, remember the white part is the sclera, and the transparent where you put your contacts is known as the cornea, so you can get a scratched cornea, okay, so that's the fibrous tunic. The vascular tunic uh, is the choroid uh, layer, pigmented layer behind the retina. Now remember when we did the dissections, or if you've done dissection in the past, uh, cats and cows have this uh, turquoise layer called the tapetum lucidum, that gives them those eyes, a reflective layer. The iris is your uh, um, colored portion, so right, brown eyes, blue eyes. Um, the pupil constrictor, concentric smooth muscle, so your pupils either constrict or dilate. And again, that's smooth muscle, that's involuntary control, meaning you couldn't tell your pupils to dilate on command. Uh, pupillary dilator spoke like myotheliums. Inner layer is the retina that lines posterior two-thirds of the eye with your rods and cones. And again, watch the video on how we see color. It's very interesting. Um, so here's a great uh, little display. Um, here's the optic nerve, the optic disc where the nerve fibers come in and they form a blind spot. Um, here's the retina, rods and cones. Here's another layer called the choroid layer. There's the sclera, which is the white. Um, here's the ciliary body that can uh, constrict and make the lens thinner or fatter. Here's the iris, color portion. The pupil is the opening. Here's the cornea. You have an anterior chamber, which is usually with aqueous uh, humor, which is like water-like. And the posterior chamber, um, and then the vitreous body, which holds the retina against the eye and gives it its shape here. And then there's the eye again. Here's are the muscles. Uh, uh, make sure you know the muscles and the actions and which cranial nerves do what. Okay, there's another view of this. So again, uh, just multiple views here. The anterior cavity contains the aqueous humor. Posterior cavity contains the vitreous humor. That's like more jelly-like. Um, the aqueous humor has posterior chamber from lens to iris. The anterior chamber is from the iris to the cornea. The lens is suspended by suspensory ligaments. And the vitreous humor or the chamber is behind the lens that gives the eyes their shape. Uh, the, neuro, uh, the retina has an oral serrata, uh, anterior margin. And again, the retina houses the rods and cones. Uh, the optic nerve exits at the optic disc. Um, so if your optic disc starts to uh, get a little bit larger, that could be concerning. Uh, we can see um, glaucoma is where you have increased pressure in the eye, and cataracts is where it starts to fog up. So a lot of times you can have cataract surgery, or with if you have glaucoma, which is increased pressure, then you're going to need drops in the eyes. All right, so for distant vision over 20 feet, the lens is flat. Okay, so that's for distant vision. And near vision, your lens will thicken and accommodate. Um, okay, so make sure you know what went for um, lenses flat for distant vision over 20 feet, and the lens thickens for near vision when you read. The rods, uh, again, they do night uh, vision, uh, black and white. The cones do day or color. Um, 
the bipolar cells, the inner neurons receive input from rods and cones, and the ganglion cells receive input from bipolar cells. So again, uh, watching that video on how we see color uh, will help you focus on this and say, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so again, here's the direction of the light, um, and that's how the rods and cones process information. So all these little nerve cells are working. Uh, vestibular, the VOR uh, reflex is a very interesting uh, connection between the vestibular system and the cranial nerves controlling eye movement keep the eyes centered on a visual stimulus even though the head is moving. During head movement the eye muscles move the eyes in the opposite direction as the head movement keeping the visual stimulus centered in the field of view. Now the VRR is a great way to train athletes or anyone that's after a concussion would be a good rehab uh, to do. Um, so let me show you a VOR chart right now. Um, here's the rods and cones. And the visual pathway, uh, ganglion cell axons make up the optic nerve, optic chiasma, and then the optic tract. Remember the nerves are in the peripheral nervous system and the tracts are in the central nervous system. The chiasm is the hemidesization, that means where it crosses. Uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus will help process this information and then it goes to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. All right, so there's the fixation point. Okay, so you see right here and then here's where it crosses so if you look at this I mean it's a, it sounds a little confusing but the your left eye sees uh, the right side the right side will see the left side so it's it's very interesting when a patient comes in they can only see half and we can say okay is it damage to the optic nerve is it damage to the optic tract So there you go. Here's the left visual field. Here's the right visual field. Again, it's upside down, and then you have to send it to the brain, and then it flips it up, right side up. So the visual field projects onto the retina through the lenses and falls on the retina as an inverted reverse image. The topography of this image is maintained as the visual information travels through the visual pathway to the cortex, and the cortex will make it right side up. Okay. Because of the intraocular distance, which results in objects of different distance falling on different spots of the two retina, the brain can extract depth perception from the two-dimensional information of the visual field. So that's how we see in 3D. And just to make sure you know, uh, the parasympathetic will cause the pupils to constrict and the sympathetic will cause the pupils to dilate. Good quiz question right there. And the wavelength, all right, so you have rod see a certain color, cone see a certain color, um, and then we can do a colorblind test right now.